the shadows, fall for the gallows. A dead man walking, to so love came calling. Rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up. Six feet under. glad you're joining us uh, again this week online. If this is your very first time, uh, my name is Joel. I am the pastor here at the church. And you can probably figure out by now that I'm hanging out in my vehicle. Don't worry, I'm not driving. I'm actually about to leave and go and pick up my youngest son from basketball practice. And uh, the reason I'm doing it for my car is it really hits at one of the core values for us as a church. And that is that we want our faith, our relationship with Jesus to impact all of life. And so it's not just something we do, but rather it is who we are. And so my hope is that through watching online, through what we share, through the music that is offered, that that it really encourages you to live all of life with Jesus and begin to think about what is your next step. And so one of the things that we want to do continually as a church is create spaces where not only you can learn and grow, but you can invite others to to be a part of it as well. And so as we jump into December, we have a number of really cool things that are happening um, in person at the church. And so maybe it's an opportunity for you to come and to join us and to be a part of it. Or maybe if you're not able to come, it's an opportunity for you to think about how are ways that I can begin to live out my faith? Because one of the really cool things about Christmas is that no matter what people believe, this is one of the most opportune times to talk about faith, to talk about God, to talk about the reality of what Christmas is all about. And so in two weeks, we're going to be starting our Christmas series um, and really looking at how do we find hope in the midst of all of life. And so I I really believe and hope that you'll uh, join us there. Listen, if you've not signed up for eBlast yet, would really appreciate if you did that. You can jump on our website, click the button, and you will start to get all the updates. In in addition to some of the emails that I send out, that that typically dives a little bit deeper around what was discussed on Sunday. And so glad you're with us. Hope that this time is meaningful and helpful and enables you to take a step this week to live out your faith with Jesus. Have a great rest of your day. Jesus, we are here, we're here for you. We've gathered in this place to honor you, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Oh, Jesus, we are here, we're here for you. Sweet joy.
We've gathered in this place to honor you, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Oh, Jesus, we are here. We're here for you. We're here for you. I'm sure you've all been in these situations where you walk into a room and everyone is doing something, but you don't know exactly what they're doing or why they're doing it. And like, you kind of look around and you feel a little embarrassed, but you don't want to say anything. And so you kind of fake it until you make it or you try to figure it out. I remember when we were living in Malawi a number of years ago, the southern part of Africa, because we were in a different culture, I would regularly be in rooms where they would start doing something. And I'm like, what is happening here? And, and I'm looking around, looking around. And it was oftentimes afterwards that I'd go up to, to one of my friends and say, can you, can you explain that to me? Like, what did I just experience? Uh, because no one likes to be in a room where you don't have a clue what is going on. Maybe for some of you, the very experience I'm describing is what church often can be like. Like maybe you show up to church and there's certain things that are happening and you're looking around and it seems like everyone else knows what's going on, but you're like, I have no clue. And it seems kind of awkward. It seems kind of weird. You know, one of the things that I think oftentimes where this may happen is when it comes to communion. You know, in churches, we take bread and we take the cup and, and we break it and we drink it and we talk about Jesus and his life, his death, his resurrection. And, and maybe for some of you, you are like, I have no idea what that's all about. I mean, there's different words. I go to different churches and some call it communion. Some call it the Lord's Supper. Others call it the Eucharist. Like, like what exactly is the deal? Is it just one of these kind of Christian religious rituals that we go through? Like, is there any meaning? For some of you, you could be like, no, 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 like celebrating communion, breaking bread, drinking from this cup is profoundly meaningful for me. You know, one of the things that we desire, whether it's in person or for you online, is, is we want to create spaces where you can encounter Jesus, where, where you can experience what God wants for you in your life. And so today, we are going to not only celebrate communion, we're not only going to break bread and drink the, from the cup, but, but I want to take a little bit of time to explain how it all began, how it can become meaningful for us as well. And where I really want to lean in on is four specific words that Jesus used on the very first night when he instituted communion or the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, that, that hopefully for you, become meaningful as it becomes, uh, for me anyways, an incredible description of the reality of our relationship with Jesus. But I think the first question we want to land on is like, why all the different names? Like, why do some churches call it communion? Why the Lord's Supper? Why the Eucharist? See, there's incredible beauty in this is the fact that in every description, it brings out a greater significance as to what we are celebrating. That, that, that in many ways, what we are doing when we break bread and drink from the cup can't be captured in just one word. And so the Lord's Supper, why do we call it that? Well, because it's all about Jesus. It's Jesus who started it. It's, it's the Lord's Supper that, that, we are, that we are celebrating him and all recognizing our need for him. Eucharist, like that, <laughs> that, that, that's a great word. What does Eucharist mean? It actually means to give thanks, that in, in the Eucharist, in the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup, we are giving thanks to God for what he has done for us in Jesus. And then communion, the, the word that if you hang out at our church a lot is the word that we often land on. Communion really speaks of how when we break the bread and we drink the cup, we are in communion with God. It, it speaks to the fact that, 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 that faith is not a ritualistic religion but that it is relationship with Jesus. And so the Lord's Supper is about Jesus. Eucharist is about giving thanks. Communion is about recognizing our relationship and our need for him. And so let's, let's jump into the passage in the Bible where, where this all begins and, and, and understand first the context 
and then how this becomes even more meaningful for us. And so we're going to turn to uh, Matthew chapter 26, and it's in verse 17 that we're going to pick up. This is what we read. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal for you? As you go into the city, he told them, You will see a certain man. Tell him, The teacher says, My time has come, and I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus told them and prepared the Passover meal there. When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve. It's, it's right here that we begin to see the context of, 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 of what communion is, is pointing us towards, of, of just this, this incredible reality. Like maybe you're wondering, why is it that, that Jewish people celebrate Passover, but Christians celebrate communion? I mean, they're both in the Bible, and so why do Christians not celebrate what Passover is? Because understand that, that one of the incredible lenses we have to look through when we read the Bible is that I believe everything points to Jesus. And so the Passover was an incredibly important celebration for the Jewish people. It, it celebrated the time when God saved his people from the slavery in Egypt. That, that you, you may or may not know, but, but the nation of Israel were, were slaves in Egypt, and they, they, they cried out to God to deliver them. And so God sent Moses to come and to speak to Pharaoh, to, to release the, the Israelites into their journey towards the promised land. And Pharaoh, when he heard this, was like, that is a terrible idea. These are my people who do all the work. They're, they're slaves. I'm not, I'm not just going to randomly let my slaves go. I don't think, I don't care who your God is. And so a succession of plagues began to come, 10 in total. And in every moment when the plague hit, Pharaoh would kind of kind of say, okay, fine, fine, leave, 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 you can go, you can go. And then he'd relent and be like, wait a second, that's a terrible idea. And so he'd bring them back, and so another plague would come. Well, it was on the 10th plague, the most devastating plague, when the angel of death came. And the plague was essentially this, that the angel of death would take the firstborn of every household, except those that had the blood of the lamb Put across the door frame. It was referred to as the Passover. The angel of death would pass over that home. And it was on that night that God's people were released, were saved from the bondage of slavery. And so what did the Jewish people do? Every single year, they would have a feast of celebration. Now, why was it called the, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Because they knew that in that moment, they're going to have to leave quickly. And so they couldn't allow the bread to rise. And so it was unleavened. And so when they would come and they'd celebrate Passover, they would remember and recognize again what God had done for them, how God had saved them from the bondage of slavery. So, so don't think for a moment that this was coincidence, that, 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 that Jesus, on the night when he was about to celebrate the Passover with his disciples, Jesus used this as a moment to point to something even greater, a, a new covenant. You see, in the Old Testament, God had a covenant with his people, which was celebrated through Passover, but Jesus was about to say, something greater is about to happen. And as we continue to read, we see what it was. Verse 26, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of of many. Uh, understand that when the disciples were there that first night, I, I have to assume that, that they were kind of in that room thinking, we have no idea what Jesus is doing or what Jesus is talking about. Why? Because Jesus was, was foretelling something that was about to happen. He was taking the Passover and saying, this symbolizes what God had done in your past, how God had saved you from the bondage of slavery. I am about to do something even 
greater. That through my death, through the breaking of my body and the pouring out of my blood, I am going to save you from the bondage of sin. Why do we as Christians not celebrate Passover? We, we recognize and we, 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 we give thanks for what God has done in the past, but it's in communion, the Eucharist, the Lord's table, that we celebrate how Jesus has saved us from the bondage of sin. So why do we use things like, like bread and, and of the cup? Like what, what is this all about? Because, because we don't just want to simply talk about it. So often we see in the Bible how, how symbols are used to speak to an even greater reality. I mean, we do this in our lives, don't we? I mean, for example, those of you that are married, you oftentimes put a wedding ring on your finger. Like, what, why do you do it? It's, it's, it's not like the ring is like the, the reality of, well, if I take it off, I'm no longer married. I put it on, I'm married again. No, no, no. It speaks to a greater reality. It speaks to your covenant, your commitment to your spouse. In the very same way, we take bread and we take the cup and they become symbols of the significance of who Jesus is and what he has done. So that's a great history lesson. You can go away and maybe hang out in a church and be like, okay, now I understand more and more what communion is all about, why they call it the Lord's Supper, what, what, what Eucharist means. But that wouldn't be good enough <laughs> because we want to make it personal. And so as we're about to do, we're going to celebrate this together. But I want to return to the four words that Jesus used to describe his actions with the bread as a means of hopefully making communion even more meaningful. I first heard this described by a, a, a Catholic priest by the, by the name of, of, of Henry Nouwen, and it, it has stuck with me that now when I come to the Lord's table, I think of these four words. So what are they? They are took, blessed, broke, and gave. Jesus said he took the bread, he blessed the bread, he broke the bread, then he gave the bread. How, how does this become more meaningful? When, when I think of the word Jesus took, for, for me it describes how God has chosen us. You know, so much of this world, whether you're young on the playground trying to get chosen for a team or, or you're trying to create an identity, it's almost like you are having to prove yourself that you are chosen based on your worth, based on your accomplishments. That's not what God has done in Jesus. When, when God has chosen us, it's not because of who we are. It's not because of what we have done. It's because of his immense love for us. You see, Christianity is not a prove-it religion. It's a grace-filled religion, that, 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 that relationship that we are chosen by God. Jesus literally took hold of us. Perhaps you're familiar with that, with that well-known hymn, Amazing Grace, that saved a wretch like me. Like, what kind of language is that? That's the language of God taking us, God choosing us. But after Jesus took the bread, he then blessed the bread. Blessing is one of those well-worn words, right? We, we, we talk about how we are blessed. But, but do we actually take time to think about what does that mean? For, for me, my understanding of blessing is a sense of contentment in our relationship with God. And it's in communion that we start to realize and to think of the many ways that we have been blessed by God given things by God that, that we don't even deserve on our own. But then Jesus took, and after he blessed, he broke. Understand that Jesus broke the bread, not, not just to distribute it to others, but it became a powerful symbol of how Jesus would break his body for our benefit. In the same way, Jesus then took the cup and he says, as my blood is poured out, like, like it, is, it is symbolic, it is, it, is, it is representative of all that Jesus has done for us. That the love of Jesus is not just simply seen in sentimental emotions, but it's a sacrifice, it's a commitment. I mean, 
I mean, why has the cross become the symbol for us as followers of Jesus? Because it speaks to this commitment of how Jesus has broken his body for us. And then we read the final word, gave. That after Jesus took, after he blessed, after he broke, he gave. This for me symbolizes our response now to what Jesus has done for us. That in the same way that Jesus has come to, to serve us, we are called to serve others. See, understand that Christianity is front-loaded. It's all about what God has done for us so that then our lives are now not in an attempt to make God love us, to have God choose us, to, to have God bless us, but rather we have already received everything in Jesus. So our life now becomes a response to what Jesus has already done. As we celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper, Eucharist, this is the story of God's great love for us in Jesus. And so as we celebrate, perhaps there is one of these words that, that you just want to reflect upon, that how you have been chosen by God, the creator of the universe, has chosen you. He has blessed you. He has willingly broken himself for you so that you can then be given to the benefit of others. The last thing we want to do as a church is to take this incredible, meaningful moment of communion and turn it into something that is confusing something that is ritualistic. But may you see this as a narration of your relationship with Jesus. And so let us come together. As Jesus did, let us take bread. Let us bless this bread. Let us break this bread. And let us take this bread as a means of celebrating Jesus' presence in our lives his forgiveness for us. And so, wherever you are, hopefully you have some bread to take. Let us take and eat in celebration of Jesus. In the very same way, let us take this cup. When Jesus says, this cup is a new covenant that will be sealed with my blood, whenever you drink from this cup, do so in remembrance, in celebration of me. And so as we drink from this cup, may you remember how you are blessed because Jesus broke his body for you, for me. So this week, as you look to live your life, don't live it in a way to try to impress God, to earn his love. Rest in the fact that you have been chosen. You are blessed. That the creator of this universe has broken his body so that we can be freed from the forgiveness of sins. And so what is our response? We receive these blessings. We receive this goodness so that we can then be a blessing to others. So this week, don't, don't look at your actions as a means of impressing God, but as a way of giving thanks for his love for you. Let me pray as we conclude. And so, Lord Jesus, we give thanks for all that you have done. We give thanks for your incredible sacrifice upon the cross, that because of your death, because of your resurrection, we are forgiven. We live with this hope of eternal life. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray that we would go from here in a way that, that, that lives a life that loves others as you have loved us. And so we ask all this, Jesus, 
in your name. Amen. Don't mind.